All right, we're live. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone, where you are. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Miss Place Living Farms. I am Christina from the Living Farms team, and I'll be your host today. And I'm joined here by Daisy Tam, who is going to be our speaker today. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everyone. Happy New Year of the Ox. All right, before I pass it on to Daisy, and before I introduce Daisy properly, I also wanted to give a little bit of a reminder as to why we are here. So today we are kicking off Misplaced, which is a 20 episode series on food systems, sustainability, and innovation. Some of you may already know that the UN has convened a summit in 2021 on the food systems. And this is part of a series of actions that we should be part of if we want to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. So why are we talking about food systems? Well, food systems are um, influence a big part of our existence and influence a big part of the environment around us. Food systems have to do with everything from you know, production to processing, transporting, and then consuming food, but also disposing food. And Daisy is going to talk about that part today as well. So it is very important if we want to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that we have healthier and better food systems. We are faced with some major contradictions. Just to name one, while we waste or lose a third of the food that is produced for humans every day, around 690 million people go to bed hungry. So the call for you know, more efficient, safer, and fairer food systems, I think it's very timely. So in this series, this is what we're gonna do. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into food systems, how they work, why are there inefficiencies and problems and how can we solve them and i'm very happy that we have daisy tam here today and i'm very happy to be introducing her so i am going to share with you our presentation so that you can see a little bit more about daisy all right so Daisy today is going to talk about our dystopic food systems and I'm really excited about this because there's a very artsy take on the whole issue. I'm sure you'll all find it very interesting. She's basically going to talk about the future of food, about sustainability and about the issue of food waste as well. But most importantly, her angle is on the urban food systems as well. So. Please, if you have questions on any of these topics, do ask your questions. Our team is going to uh, collect them and pass them on to us. So the nice thing about having Daisy here is that she has many different perspectives to offer. She's not only a researcher and an academic, but she's also an advocate for sustainable food systems and an entrepreneur and has started some very good initiatives um, related to food waste and food rescue. So her uh, values and the things that she cares about are food security, education, and sustainability. And we're really excited to hear about that. Daisy is an assistant professor at the Hong Kong Baptist University in the Department of Humanities and Creative Writing. And as I mentioned, she is also the founder of some very great initiatives such as Foodworks and the application breadline. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Daisy to continue with her talk. Thank you so much, Daisy. Thanks so much for inviting me, Christina. I'm really excited to be um, speaking to quite an international audience. Um, and uh, well, hopefully you'll enjoy this talk. Uh, being the first to kickstart this amazing series. So I do wear different hats, um, but I'm hoping to come bring these all these different perspectives together 
to explain a little bit about um, why, you know, why I care and why I hope all of you should also care about this question of our food system too. Um, many of you would have heard of these uh, statistics. By 2050, two thirds of the world's population will live in cities. That means another 2.5 billion people will, will be moving to urban areas, much like the one that we are in in Hong Kong today. 90% um, of this growth will take place in Asia and Africa. And the question is, well, how are we going to feed the world? Um, the Chinese word for population is actually uh, quite befitting because it literally is a man, yan, and then hao, and a mouth, right? So population, the word in Chinese, the population actually means a person with a mouth. And it is a question about feeding the world. Um, from the title, you might have guessed that I have a, a, a side interest also in science fiction, and I really enjoy um, watching them, partly for entertainment, but I also find it a really useful outlet to look at how our particular generation or how different uh, generations are actually imagining the potential of what technology could bring. So I find it a very rich uh, place to look for ideas. Um, this is obviously from the fifth element, and um, <laughs> as a little joke, perhaps the future of food would be something like, uh, you know, chicken that comes out from granules uh, from the microwave. Or maybe not. Um, the first part I would like to uh, focus on is talking about food loss and food waste. They're technically different things. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and just to recall this wonderful uh, title, wonderfully themed um, uh, talk series called Misplaced, I think it's a very apt title. Um, as Christina introduced uh, the idea to us very early on, one third of all the food that we produce actually goes to wastes. So um, that's equivalent uh, to 1.3 billion tons of food uh, worth almost 1 trillion US dollars. In industrialized regions, almost 50% of the total food thrown away is actually still fit for consumption. Now, when we look at the UNFAO figures, around 30% of fish and seafood are lost. Um, in fruit and veg, which has the highest uh, wastage, it's about 45%. In dairy, it's about 20%. Um, and you can see when they try to show you what that means, 20% of dairy food losses um, is equivalent to 29 million tons of dairy products are lost or wasted every year, equivalent to 574 billion eggs. Um, and these are really quite huge figures that we need to understand why and how waste came to be. Um, I think as an academic, I like to describe myself as a waste scholar um, <laughs> or a rubbish scholar, <laughs> either works. Uh, the idea is that we, we study waste um, and we study the how and why of waste um, as well as its management and treatment. Um, and the reason is because waste for me is not a fixed concept. Um, there is this anthropologist, British anthropologist called Mary Douglas, who wrote in this book called Purity and Danger, which I still love to, uh, to this day. Um, and while she was studying dirt, she was saying that there's no such thing as dirt. There's no such thing as absolute dirt. Dirt is just matters out of place. So what she talks about, this idea of out of placeness, is in fact pointing us to think about the classification, uh, classification systems that produce this waste. So it's about this idea of where we put things and where they don't fit, they go out, right? So I think waste is very much, um, it very much operates like this. Um, here, I will give you the two definitions of food loss and food waste. Um, they're different, uh, but I still think, and then I think we can talk more in the discussion part, why these two don't quite encompass all the food waste that we are seeing today. 
So food loss occurs when food that spills, spoils, incurs an abnormal reduction in quality, such as bruising or wilting, or otherwise gets lost before it reaches the consumer. So the idea of food loss is that perhaps it's accidental, perhaps it's lack of infrastructure or something that um, makes us makes the food um, not fit for consumption. So that happens before it comes to the consumers. Whereas food waste um, refers to food that is of good quality and fit for human consumption, but does not get consumed um, be because it's discarded, either before or after it spoils. So the idea of food loss and food waste almost is, is placed within that sort of the production cycle and then this consumption cycle. Um, the situation in Hong Kong is mimics much of the world's urban environments. So in large cities, we see a lot of food being wasted. In Hong Kong, the figures are 3,600 tons of food gets thrown into landfill every day. Um, that's equivalent of 250 double-decker buses in weight. Um, as I said, the food actually gets thrown into landfill and landfill that is quickly and has been under huge amounts of strain uh, for the past couple of years because it has been predicted to be saturated um, well in this period of time so it, essentially we are running out of space to store all this waste and that sort of craziness that you see uh, in the in the global situation is also mimicked in or mirrored in Hong Kong in the sense that 20 percent of the population is poor and so when they live on the poverty line or below the poverty line, what that means is about um, having $30, uh, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong dollars um, um, of, for food every day, and that's for three meals, which is quite difficult when we are trying to talk about food security. So in this uh, second part, I will talk about the urban food system. So kind of knowing all these issues about the crazy amount of waste that we generate and also the amount of people that are suffering from hunger, what is it that is not quite right in our urban food system? Um, and what can we do about it? Um, so when I talk about food security, uh, there might be quite a few misconceptions about what that means. Um, some people think it's about food safety, other, th other people think about um, uh, chronic hunger, um, in, which you see in developing countries. And in fact, food security refers to three main things. But the overall definition is that when all people at all times have, uh, have access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. Now, these three elements combined together offers you as a household or as a country or as a nation, food security. Um, that means you have to take three boxes. One is availability. Um, that means having sufficient quantities of food available, available on a consistent basis. Um, and the second one is access. So having sufficient resources to obtain appropriate foods for a nutritious diet. Now access can be physical Right. Some of you might have heard of food deserts in the United States where physical distance is a barrier to accessing food. Here in Hong Kong, um, luckily, we don't have that much of a physical access issue, but what we do have is a financial uh, access issue. So access can be various things. Um, and lastly is food use. So do we have the appropriate um, knowledge and skills, um, understanding of basic nutrition and care to provide ourselves with a nutritious meal to sustain and maintain a healthy life. Um, adequate water and sanitation is also very much part of that concern. Now, in urban environments, um, we depend a lot on imports, and I can talk more of that um, more of that when we when we discuss. Um, here, I want to just, in my presentation, talk uh, more about the work I do around food waste and how, um, how we can offer an alternative or at least one of the ideas in which we could try and address that. Um, so, food rescue is 
probably something that you are already aware of um, and has been has become very really um, popular over the last decade. Um, food rescue is the act of re repurposing or reappropriating surpluses and then usually to give to community organizations or charities that serve um, the needy. So here in Hong Kong, these are just some uh, examples of the good organizations out there doing excellent work to recuperate surpluses um, and reduce the waste and, and, and channel that into nutritious and healthy meals for, uh, for the poor. Um, I take part in this food rescue scene um, as an academic and also as a researcher. And what I've done is I've created a platform in which we send volunteers to collect bread from all around the bakeries in Hong Kong. Um, I mean, the idea of um, the idea of food rescue is great, but in fact, the practice itself is filled with challenges. Um, food rescue is at best <laughs> a logistical nightmare because food is available all around the city. So geographically, it's very dispersed, but they are only available at a certain amount of a certain window of time, right? So let's say bakeries, um, they are all closing within a two hour window of uh, one from, from another. So how do you try and rescue um, all these leftovers from all these shops all across the city? So it is a logistical challenge. Um, and it's also uh, a sort of a rescue is indeed like trying to go save the food um, um, from being wasted because in this particular case, the bread gets wasted after the shops close because they can no longer be sold the next day. And if we don't go and save it, then it will go to landfill. So the challenge for me is a logistical one, but it's also one which I find uh, an interesting opportunity to engage the public to do to work together. Um, and the idea is because I think with the right kind of technology, um, we can engage in something which I call the collect, uh, collective intelligence, which is the idea that we can enable humans to make better decisions based on better information using digital technologies. So the Breadline does that by offering real-time information um, to the volunteers and connecting them directly to the donors so that they can go at the right time at the right place. Um, because we cannot predict where the leftovers and the surfaces are uh, very often without this particular um, intervention, then volunteers might end up in a place where there's not much bread left or that they are sold out. And that would have been a waste of their time as well. So um, I'm just wrapping up now if we're good for time. Um, the idea is that with Breadline, um, it's a form of crowdsourcing logistics. It's a form of collective intelligence. And I think it's a much more effective way of mobilizing the crowd uh, to help with uh, rescuing leftovers from an urban environment such as, uh, the, uh, uh, such as Hong Kong. Um, and finally, if we do that enough, I would say that perhaps this dystopic uh, imagination of the future of where our food might come from uh, could be delayed for perhaps a few more generations. Um, so I would say that food rescue and reducing the amount of waste that we're producing now would be the first step that we have to act upon um, in order to move to a more sustainable system. So that's it from my speaker notes. I don't actually know how much time I took there. Actually. Oh, the timing was great. No worries. It's 1.20 now here in Hong Kong. Thank you so much for your presentation, Daisy. Um, I hope we're back on camera. Yes, fantastic. Well, I really appreciated your presentation. I thought it was not only very interesting, but also it's difficult to pack the right information in just 15 minutes. <laughs> and I think um, this was just great. So many interesting facts, of course. And I took some notes here. 
I think, of course, I love the references to the sci-fi movies, the Magellans and the Snowpiercer, um, absolutely fitting in this case. I think um, it would be interesting to dig a little bit deeper in some issues that you mentioned we wanted to maybe talk a little bit more about. Um, and I think one of the first things that caught my attention was when you were explaining food loss and food waste, mm -hmm. you also said that this is not all that is lost right. at all. Mm -hmm. So what, what else? <laughs> we pay attention to <laughs> right yeah that was <laughs> the not so subtle i want not to talk so about this exactly. afterwards um yeah so the idea of food loss and food waste seems to uh, uh, encompass a lot but in fact we also need to look at industrial productions mm -hmm. um so i think one of the uh, one of the lesser talked elements or aspects of food waste is overproduction mm -hmm. so we are constantly overproducing and, it, and overproducing because in terms of hedging against um, market prices. So for example, farmers would have to grow more and leave them to rot because of the way they have to um, hedge against the market prices, mm. right? And that's a way of protecting their livelihoods. Um, in, in manufacturing, in factories, they constantly overproduce because of, um, well, again, to do with either uh, the matching of supply and demand or in the way that the um, manufacturing processes work such that, you know, when they change recipes, they don't stop the machine because they, the machines take time to calibrate in order to fit everything, in order to produce what it says on the tin. And it actually ha requires a huge amount of technology and mm -hmm. precise calculation. And so when you change, in the same canning factory, for example, if you change different uh, foods and different uh, recipes or different products, well, they keep the machines going. And so during this period of time, um, all that is being produced are edible, but not mm -hmm. sellable, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of edibility equated with um, food is not um, that simple in an industrialized uh, form of production. And so these are the kind of things that I think um, that's the kind of thing that is not encompassed in the idea of loss and waste. Yeah. Um, that overproduction inherent in our system um, that is industrial, that is mass, that is mass scale production. Um, we are all, you know, part of part of that kind of uh, yeah system. system. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right, because when we think of food waste, we think of the post-consumption, so it's like leftover concept, right? Mm. But now we were talking about producing at scale to match costs, it's something that we see in fashion quite a lot with the fast fashion system as well, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the future as well. So that's something to keep in mind. What can we as consumers do to address that part though? Mm, yeah, I mean, that is very hard. Tricky. <laughs> that is tricky, that is tricky. But yeah, it's also important because you don't want to end up feeling so overwhelmed that you can't act upon it. And I think that that's why reducing food waste from our end, like living in cities, being mostly a consumer rather than a producer, yeah. um, um, is, is, is helpful in, in doing that. So I, I, I do think uh, food rescue has to be the first thing that we tackle. Um, we reduce some of these losses. We encourage uh, our local shops and we, and, and we put pressure on the big retailers to donate the food that they cannot sell. Um, I think this is the one thing that we can begin with. Yeah. And then, and then we can, and then we can explore, um, yeah, shorter supply chains, more regional distribution, support your local producers. I mean, all of these, which are following topics that will come in the next few weeks. Sure. Yeah. But still, this cutting our food waste and rescuing food, it sends a signal as well, right? So it it can be a step forward. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's some sort of questions that that we relate to what you've been asking. Um, yeah. So we're looking at the questions here. Um, I think this one is pretty interesting, the first one here. Um, Kushbu is asking, are there other factors hindering access to food security in Hong Kong other than the financial aspect? Um, yes, that's a really good question and one that I uh, didn't have time to explain further. Food security for Hong Kong, um, 
for on an individual household level uh, was the way I tried to explain it in terms of financial and physical access. But <clears throat> as a city, in fact, we are ranked um, quite low out of uh, certain indexes. So there's a food vulnerability index um, and which ranks about 80 or 90 countries in the world. And we are the last 10, you know, at some point we were next to Sudan and Azerbaijan. And then at some point we were next to Pakistan. And the reason why we are so food uh, vulnerable is because we over rely on imports. So in Hong Kong, we import um, around 95% of our food. Um, we do not, in, or we no longer invest in local production or local agriculture. I think our vegetable production right now is less than 2%, um, whereas it was at maybe 40 years ago, we still had 30, 40% of um, self-sufficiency rate. Now, in terms of urban development, um, I'm not suggesting that we can be self-sufficient, and I don't think this is the idea of it, but we need to diversify our food source, and we need to sort of have different, um, um, yeah, buffer zones or ideas, and and R&D, like research and development. Singapore is absolutely investing in research and development to improve their food security. They want to be self sufficient 30% by 2030. I mean, that's a very clear target. Um, so yeah, I think that that was a really good question there in terms of uh, vulnerability. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's take a look at the other questions here. Um, so maybe the question from Ava. Are residential homes or commercial companies bigger wasters of food? And do you have any tips of reducing food waste at home? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> yes, I, I mean, I'm, there's so many uh, things that I love about um, home cooking because I think that's just the least wasteful uh, way of, um, of, of handling food, right? Like, um, Cooking with leftovers is one of my favorite things because I think it's also a very creative process. You're like, okay, I have limited, I have <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then whatever you produce actually comes out really well. So I think the kind of daily practices that you engage in, of course, um, how you handle food, how you manage your stock, how you don't overbuy, and 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 how do you manage that kind of one way is is obviously one thing. But I would suggest. Um, perhaps even in the shopping side, um, to think about purchasing from more local uh, places. Because very often, if you buy from a more local or regional producer, the likelihood is that the supply chain would be less wasteful. Um, for mass manufactured products, and even this, it's such, a, it's such an abyss that I, 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 I can barely understand just the surface of it. But a, can, a simple can of tomatoes could be flown around the world like four times before it actually reaches the market shelves. And it's the cheapest way to do it, right? So tomatoes produced in Asia would be flown um, or produced in uh, North America would be flown to Asia to be processed, to be then canned in the third place and then to be then sold in the fourth place. So whilst we, we change the, our way of being, it's also, I think, important now to also push and understand a little bit and look behind the hood to look at the kind of wasteful practices um, that, that we are maybe un, unknowingly participating in. So that's the next level I would suggest that yeah. we can do. Awesome, thanks. Those are good, good suggestions, good recommendation. Um, taking a look at the other questions and the time and if you don't mind, I think we'll squeeze in one more question. Yeah, because yeah, I know sure, this yeah. is a topic that you care about, actually. Um, since we talked about food literally flying around the globe, globe four times, uh, but we also talked about hunger mm -hmm. and hunger crisis and access to food, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper on that and talk about food security. Mm -hmm. So it's an issue that we normally relate to the concept of poverty yes. or like poor people or uh, like low economic um, status but is it 
that simple because we know there's like contradictions where, for example, we read about certain countries where food insecure people also suffer with like obesity, obesity so sure. in their life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good uh, question because the idea of food security um, and immediately linking that with the poor is understandable, but it's not only the poor that faces um, food insecurity. Um, I would say that our food system, talking on a city level here in Hong Kong, um, is insecure, right? So we are food insecure in Hong Kong. What does that mean? And, you know, is this a very dystopic future that I'm again <laughs> sort of threatening listeners with? Um, it's not necessarily true. If you remember just at the beginning of COVID last February, when the news broke, there was a sudden dip in supply. Well, usually on Chinese New Year, we, we also have a bit less. Um, but that disruption and um, made the prices go up very quickly very quickly and the same um and the same happened during typhoon mankot and during um the cold winter in 2016. so these are just simple examples of how we are reliant on a continuously flowing food supply chain and if anything happens that that ruptures or disrupts that cycle then we are without food, really. Um, and then, yes, at some point, the prices will go up. So those um, those of us who has the financial means to um, <clears throat> protect themselves from that, or, or, or at least buffer themselves with with uh, or using money to solve that problem, might be able to buy themselves some time. But in the long run, it's it's a problem that we can't just solve by throwing money at it. So I think that's why uh, food security is a much, um, yeah, it's a much bigger thing than just uh, poverty alleviation. Um, it has to do with the way a city can become more resilient. Sustainability is one, but resilient is another because we can't ignore the fact that these disruptions will happen, whether through a pandemic or a cl climatic event or anything else that it will hit us at some point or another, but how will we bounce back from it is what matters. And so I think having these little small, you know, local solutions or district solutions or citywide solutions yeah. at any level um, that you could think of is going to be helpful yeah. in, in, in providing that security. Yeah, for sure. And we've definitely seen it with COVID, right? How much it has disrupted us, not just food-wise, even toilet paper-wise, yeah, yeah. so right. um, definitely a good example of disruption. And um, I think we're also going to talk in the future about more self-sufficient way to have access to food, such as the new trend towards home growing and the urban farming. So mm -hmm. that, I think, is a very fitting topic. I see other questions coming through. Can I take this one? You want to take it? Fantastic. <laughs> sure, sure. So, because I'm so proud. <laughs> oh, awesome. Stevia, may I know more about Breadline's operations and its effectiveness? Would be great to hear some examples because I feel like logistics has been quite a headache for sustainability. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so. Um, I'm, I'm proud because that's precisely what Redline tried to tackle. It was like one of those issues where it's just 300, and just imagine like 300 bakeries all across Hong Kong, all closing within a two hour window. How are you gonna, how are you gonna uh, tackle that? And I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, compared with a more conventional system where you probably sign up through a charity and um, get assigned a route or you claim a particular route and just show up or show up on the day or you call beforehand before going there to pick up uh, bread. Um, Breadline, in fact, improved our, the system 109%. Um, I sh yeah. <laughs> I should write this up a little bit uh, with, in, in to show. that you collected more bread than you would have without that system? or it, No, I mean, bread availability is not something that we can control. Mm -hmm. But the amount of people that we need to hit the 
the, okay. where the shops have bread right. is, is the sort of efficiency rate right. that we are trying to calculate. Okay. And it's always like 109% because on any given night, about 20 to 50% of the shops sell out. Um, so you don't want to send volunteers where, to where there is no bread and you want to send them where there is most bread. You, you definitely do not want them to miss the ones with the big, um, big, big holes. Yeah. So by allowing them to claim uh, runs even on the last minute and by providing them with real-time information about the approximate leftover uh, of bread from the bakery, they're able to respond in a very agile manner. And so improving agility was one of the things that we tried to tackle in terms of bread, uh, in terms of um, bread lines design. Um, and the second thing is how do we enable people who don't know each other to work together collectively, but independently. Mm -hmm. So this was again useful during COVID because we didn't have to call any of our volunteers in for a briefing, you know, have a whole meeting about it and then send them off after that. It was just very sort of independent. And that's what allowed us to continue operating during the past year. Um, yeah, so 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 that's that's the uh, that's that's my proud moment. <laughs> and we're continuing to improve. Yeah. We should, we should be proud. It's clearly a great initiative with a great impact as well. Mm -hmm. Much, much needed and I'm sure with COVID and the crisis coming from it even more. So, um, are we still up for a question? Can we do one last one? There was one that is related <laughs> to breadline since you were um, keen on talking. I don't know why I can't scroll down, but I remember it and it was very simple. Um, ah. I was asking, yes, exactly, what happened? <laughs> right, so um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, Breadline actually collaborates with local charities. Um, so we deliver, um, so I, 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 I run it with uh, Foodlink, um, but, um, and then in collaboration, we collect the bread. Uh, and then once we've collected the bread, we are currently serving um, Impact HK, which is an organization that serves the homeless. So we stock up the community fridge on a Friday evening. And then um, um, Impact HK uh, in, at the guest house in their in their Taikok Choi location um, offers resources for the homeless, so they can go and they can help help themselves and replenish um, what they need from water to bread. And then they also have volunteers um, that do what they call the kindness walk. So they would take some of these resources and go out to find the street sleepers and give it to them. Um, another organization that we support is uh, the Refugee Union. So um, refugee families uh, that are uh, in Hong Kong trying to be, uh, have their papers processed um, are often happy to have extra help and extra resources uh, and, and have bread for their families. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that question. Last question of today. Thank you so much, Daisy, for this. Um, very insightful, very interesting, and the perfect way to kick off the Midway <laughs> series. So, thank you again for participating. Thanks and for having me. You're welcome. And before um, I say goodbye to you all, just um, a quick reminder we're meeting again next week with our next speaker, that's Paul Munham from the SDG2 Advocacy Hub, and he's going to talk about SDGs and food. So, it's going to be really interesting. I also wanted to remind you that we are sharing a feedback form for this webinar. It's going to be sent via email if you signed up. Otherwise, it's going to be in the link of the recorded video on our social media. So please do let us know um, how it went. And yeah, thank you so much again, Daisy. Thank you. Looking forward to the next one. Yes, for sure. And thanks, everyone. Have a good one.